And welcome to a special edition of Space Surfic Reviews, our top 10 personal favorite albums. I'm Kevin T. Rodriguez of TheMovieWizard.com. This is Marco Cabote. And I rock. Oh, so he wishes. But we have decided, because we are both big music fans, problem is, we don't ever agree, or we, at least we rarely agree on music. So we decided we would put together a top 10 list of, you know, personal favorite albums. These might not be the best albums ever written, although a couple of them might be. They're just ones that we listen to quite frequently, recently, if not throughout our lives. You know, there's some honorable mentions on this list, like I like Phil Collins, and I would wanted to put his um, No Jacket Not Required album on there, or, you know, several Beatles records, or Michael W. Smith's Change Your World, but there's, or Christopher Cross's self-titled debut album, and also his biggest seller, really hard, or Chicago records, things like that I would like to put on, but you just gotta pick and choose. Yeah, uh, it's hard to do a top ten list of albums because you just end up cutting a bunch of stuff that you love off of it anyway. Like, I was gonna put up Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, which is an absolute classic in every respect. I absolutely love Iron Maiden, and not one of their albums made it on there, despite the fact I almost put Power Slave or Dance of Death on there. But I went with other stuff, and Kylie Minogue. I'm a big Kylie Minogue fan. I have every album, but just didn't make the top ten. My number ten pick would be Maroon 5's It Won't Be Soon Before Long. Now, I know Maroon 5 is technically a new band, so it's hard to say whether they're going to be classics or whether they're just going to have a couple hit albums and then move on. But darn it, this record has hit after hit, song after song. There's really only one track I have a problem with. And almost all of them on my iPod I've listened to at least 50 times or more, so it's kind of hard to ignore it. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it sounds very popish, but it's very adult pop, which is a nice change of pace once in a while, because most of the time it's dumb and very general, and these guys are actually at least singing about something. Hmm. I don't think I know a Moon 5 song. Yeah, you probably do. do um... That's a high-pitched whiny guy. Kind of. I'm not going to put it high pitch. I mean, I think the, I think their instruments are more high pitched than he is. But anyway, you're number 10. My number 10 is kind of a special one when I was putting this list together, and that would be uh, the 1994 debut of Mila's The Divine Comedy, which is actually Mila Jovovich's album. And hmm. this one holds special significance yeah. to me because it was the first album I ever bought outside of rock, like 80s, 90s rock. Hmm. And I bought it and was like, hell is this and I hated it and then the more I listened to it the more it kind of opened up doors to listening to music that was different and other albums like The Clash and uh, various just random artists like Pink Floyd and those sort of things and, and, and interesting stuff from the 80s got thrown in there and it really it really was a, it's a significant album to me and I quite enjoy it it's, it's actually kind of a folksy pop album almost but <laughs> it's got some excellent songs my on. ninth best pick for the best album is The Eminem Show by I think it's Dr. Dre. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. It's Eminem, folks, of course. Um, it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly why I like Eminem. Some people have told me it's because he's white. I really don't think that's true. There are a lot of um, white rappers I've heard that <laughs> were never any good. Um, Eminem just kind of struck a chord with me. He was more honest than most. He had something to actually say. He sang about something other than hookers, pimps, and drugs. He does? Yeah. Oh, that's right, he kills his wife. Well, one thing, but the opening track, I think, is a pretty good example of, like, actual writing about why kids are attracted to, attracted to these things in the first place in their lyrics. Then he has songs about his troubled childhood and stuff. stuff. But, you know, I think it's overall a very good listen, very catchy. Um, I'm a little surprised myself that I picked it, but, you know, what? what um, with the exception of maybe that Superman track... I don't skip many of the tracks. Huh. I've personally never liked Eminem, and I've been editing my list as we've been talking because I've been thinking about other stuff, and I decided, being that it's kind of loosely based, you had a rap album there. I moved, shuffled stuff around when I was looking at it, and I have a rap album at number nine now. Okay. now. And that is Eric B. and Rakim's Follow the Leader. That's quite possibly the best damn rap album ever made. Never they, heard of it. Never heard of him. Shocking. Well, rap for the most part, see, I, I didn't ever get into rap when I was young. I did get into it, I got into older stuff. And yeah, like, Eric B. and Rakim's like, Follow the Leader or is, no, their, their debut album is, is held in the highest of high regards. And uh, this one, I just picked it up because I really liked the first one, and I was shocked. I thought this was one of the best damn, it's the most intricately lyric, 
lyrically complex album I've ever heard for a rap album, and it was made in like '89 or something. Well, and it actually, that doesn't. This sounds kind of interesting. Actually, yeah, no, it's excellent. Oh, well, oh that's good to hear. Yeah. Okay, as a complete 180 now, I'm going to list something I almost guarantee none of you have heard. Number eight on my list is Stephen Curtis Chapman's Heaven in the Real World. Now, if any of you are looking at me and just saying, what the heck? What the heck? Exactly, like that. Um, Stephen Curtis Chapman is actually a Christian artist, and this album is significant in more than many, in a few ways, because Christian artists are kind of funny, some people, like rap and country, they kind of have a audience that they have to play to, and they don't hit the mainstream. And a couple of them, like Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith and Cutlass, who did hit the mainstream, usually did it by kind of slowly taking God out of the picture, out of the music, because people found it too restrictive. Not Chapman, though. He made the CD. It was it was about God. It included God, and it shocked the world because it became a radio-friendly album. Went platinum 14 times. It's a solid listen, and instead of like using this, you know, we love God, it actually challenges some... I don't know what his feelings were at the time, but he seemed to be asking some real hard questions about how you can believe in God when the, there are so much bad things that happens in the world, and that's the reoccurring theme, and hence the album of the title it makes sense because throughout this album he's essentially looking for proof of heaven in the real world uh, actually very daring album for a christian release huh yeah well awesome all right <laughs> uh, okay then um <laughs> this is fun to do folks it is and uh next up on we're number eight number eight yeah number eight on my list being like scribbled all over it mid video <laughs> is uh i believe um it would be uh black sabbath if you're familiar with black sabbath their band never heard of them in my life i'm totally kidding. okay <laughs> most famous in the 70s with Os osborne singing for them which means that the best album that they ever made in my top 10 favorite albums is 1980s heaven and hell which didn't have ozzy osborne on it because Makes perfect sense yeah Screw that guy. Seriously. I went and saw Black Sabbath with Ozzy Osbourne. He ruined the whole show just by himself. That's not why I'm changing this. But I got picked this one up with Ronnie James Dio as their singer, their second singer and best singer. And my God, it's one of the best albums ever made, especially in the genre of metal music, which, of course, is stupid now. But, yeah, figured that's worth mentioning. The title track alone, along with Lady Evil and other tracks like that, means it outshined everything they made in the 70s. So there, take that, stupid Aussie fans. Okay, well, anyway, I'm going to go... At number seven on my list is actually a Toby Keith album, and I know what you guys are going to say, and I completely agree. Toby Keith releasing a new record every year for the past six years is definitely way too much of a good th <laughs> thing. It just... He hasn't... Doing that really spreads the quality <laughs> too much. <laughs> But I will give him this record, and it would almost be anticlimactic if I couldn't, because this was the record where he literally quit, dropped one of his record contracts, so the record studio said, we won't release this, no one will like it, and he said, screw you, I know people will like it, and he was absolutely right. It's How Do You Like Me Now, which has the famous title song, which I think almost anyone can relate to, because this is the kind of thing you would want to say to a jerk and ex-girlfriend, just a song that kind of connected with people, and that's what it's mainly known for. But I also like it because it has a lot more personal songs that don't get the credit they deserve. And it's kind of a shame they don't, because the opening track just leaves such an impression most people don't want to go beyond it. I'm not exactly sure what to make of his career nowadays, but he definitely had this one shining spot. So, really? Yeah. Well, that's good to know. I don't think I've ever listened to a T Toby Keith album, nor a song. I don't know a single song by him. Uh, should have been a cowboy? I take that back. I know one song by him. And that's not a terrible song. I'll give him that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 